In the spring of 1986, my family and I moved into a small three-bedroom house in northern Minnesota. I was four years old. This was a big deal for my parents. It was their first real home. They didn't have stellar credit, but they were able to purchase the home through contract for deed. The middle-aged couple they bought it from did mention that they believed the house was haunted. Supposedly, an old lady passed away in the home. According to the prior owners, you could still hear her rocking chair creaking on quiet nights. I didn't find out about this until long after we moved away from the home. Being the eldest, I was able to get my own room in the basement. I wasn't accustomed to being so far away from mum and dad, yet I don't recall it bothering me. They were right up the stairs, through the kitchen and down the hall. Regardless of that fact, I began suffering from night terrors. This went on for around six months, according to my mother. She's always been sh short of astonished by my memory as a young child, so she tells me. Most of the night terrors were just bad dreams or waking up in the dark, feeling isolated and scared. I remember fabricating dreadful faces out of cheap wood panelling. It came naturally. Everything was a monster. One particular night sticks out in my mind. It always will. It started out pleasant enough. I was dreaming. I can see Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck and Goofy. They're all swimming at our local beach. My dad's driving by slowly in his 82 Chevy Caprice station wagon. I press my face to the window, praying dad will stop. My brother, seated next to me, sees what I see. We plead with dad to stop. He promptly says no. Of course, mom backs him up. My dream of Disney characters at the beach is suddenly interrupted by singing. As my eyes open, I slowly realise it was a dream. I remember wanting to go back to the dream so desperately. Donald Duck was my favourite. I became distracted by the darkness. Everything was as dark as the blackest night imaginable. Where's the singing coming from? It took me a moment to adjust to the reality that I was awake. That dreadful singing remained. I couldn't make out the words to the uncanny melody. I can't help but wonder now if it was another language. It wasn't a pleasant song being sung. Was it a cry for help? I was facing the wall and my curiosity was getting the best of me. I decided to turn my head towards the sound. What I witnessed in the closet just across from my bed made me freeze in absolute terror. There, in my closet, sat a woman. The look on her face was one of confusion or fear. She didn't look directly at me. Her eyes were wide, but staring off into the corner of my room. Her body illuminated in a shining light, which made her orange hair shimmer. The light also made her entire body visible in an otherwise pitch black room. She was wearing an old-fashioned dress, slightly overweight, and in a sitting position. What was she sitting on? I don't know. I couldn't look anymore. The sight terrified me. I turned to face the wall again. I needed to leave the room, but I was frozen in fear. If I got up to run, she would certainly see me. Would she chase me? I had to escape. Mom and Dad were right upstairs. Without looking at her again, I sprung up and out of bed, then bolted out of my room. I didn't look back, even as I ran up the stairs. With every stair I climbed, I imagined my feet being grabbed. Would she drag me back to that hell in my room? My poor parents were awakened by my shrieking cries. Mom was concerned and Dad appeared upset and a little annoyed as I relayed the horrors that played out in my room. I held my mom's hand all the way back down the stairs. We made it to my room. I refused to go in. Dad clicked on the light. She was gone. No sign of her. I refused to sleep in that room and was allowed to sleep on the floor of my parents' room for the rest of the night. Shortly after this experience, my parents had me move in with my brother in the neighboring room. I never saw her again. I investigated that closet a few times over the years. I recalled cleaning it out in a desperate attempt to find evidence of her existence. Maybe she left something behind. I wish I knew who she was or what she wanted. 
When I was younger, I used to fantasize of asking God about the secrets of the universe. I confess I still do. The lady in the closet is no exception. I adore the couple that live next door. A duplex, our homes are connected. And over the last few years, I could hear the poor guy coughing or heaving from my bathroom all the time. Our bathrooms must be next to each other. He was very ill. I knew it was him and always felt bad hearing someone's private bathroom suffering. Never told him this, no way. He passed away a few months ago, but occasionally I can still hear him. She still lives there and we talk. I know there's no other male that lives with this widow or visits. It's 100% not her. And it's the identical sound I grew accustomed to all these years. When someone's heaving, you sort of hear their voice, I guess. And this is not just a male. This is his voice. I wouldn't dare tell her, one, I can hear sounds from their bathroom, and or two, that I believe I can hear him. And three, that it sounds like the suffering cough and heaving I've heard for years. I'm sure there's a rational explanation. I don't know what I believe, but I don't like the thought of him still suffering. Anyway, I miss him. He was such a treasure. I try to check up on her and help her often. I miss you, BR. Please rest in peace. You are free from suffering now. I couldn't tell you exactly how old I was when I had my first supernatural experience, but I'm guessing I was somewhere between seven and nine years of age. I was living with my grandparents in Miami. I shared a room with my younger brother on the first floor of their two-story duplex. It was nighttime and everyone was asleep, including my brother. I was lying on my left side in bed, facing the door to the room and about three foot to the right was the door to the closet, which was closed of course. I remember I used to stare at the closet door most nights to fall asleep. Why? I couldn't tell you, but that's what I did. And on this particular night, after having stared at the closet door for a while, I suddenly saw an almond-shaped light appear. I stared at it for a bit, wondering what the heck that was, when suddenly, the light started travelling along the wall to the right. It went across every wall in a clockwise direction, until it arrived at the spot it had started at. Suddenly, a second almond-shaped light appeared next to it, and that light did the same thing. It travelled across every wall in the room until it stopped right back where it had originally appeared, all while the first light stayed in place. And it wasn't until then that I realised that those two lights together were shaped like eyes. It looked like two glowing eyes that were looking at me. My body was completely engulfed in fear, and I didn't know what to do. I was too afraid to scream or get up, so I just pulled the blanket over my head. After a few moments, I peeked out and saw that the lights were gone. I then got up and turned on the lights and tried to make sense of things. But from that day to my now 37 years of age, I know nothing that could have possibly explained that. Since then, I've had countless other supernatural experiences in life, but never have I seen those lights again or anything even remotely similar. I've also never heard anyone tell a story similar to mine. Has anyone here ever experienced anything like this? I used to live in the Philippines, and I have several real-life encounters with the supernatural. Catholic schools there used to be cemeteries during the World Wars, where dead Filipinos, Americans, Spaniards and Japanese were laid to rest. My first experience with a ghost was around the fourth grade, after a dance rehearsal with my group. Me and Ariel were the ones left on the top floor, to do some cleaning since the others already went downstairs. Take note that this encounter happened in a Catholic grade school, where stories about ghosts are common. We were talking about something when her eyes widened when she looked to her left. I asked her what's going on, but she continued to ignore me. Ariel, Ariel, I asked. I decided to look where she was staring at, and there it was. It was a heavy, 
puff of smoke, like a fatty rain cloud, floating out of nowhere in front of the stadium. Along with this smoke was a disfigured face that seemed to be in pain. The face was screaming a quiet scream. She doesn't have any eyes, only eye sockets. The weirdest thing about her was that she doesn't have a body. Just a huge puff of smoke in her head with a crown sitting on top of her. She was monotone. Her colour was the same as the smoke. Grey. She floated three to five feet from left to right and she just disappeared. A second after that, my eyes directed towards Ariel slowly. Did you see that? She nodded. We left the top floor and ran downstairs like there's no tomorrow. I don't remember what happened next, but when I talked to Ariel about this occurrence last year, she didn't remember a thing. She shivered after hearing that story. I would honestly love if anyone knew any scientific or plausible explanation for what I'm about to explain. So roughly six years ago, my friend and I were casually walking through my housing estate, just chatting and nothing out of the ordinary, just like every other evening. Suddenly, for a split second, the whole sky just became daytime. It had already been dark for at least an hour at this stage. It wasn't like a light that was bright in the sky. If I can help you picture this scenario, there was no light being radiated. It was just daytime for a split second. Absolutely dumbfounded, very confused. We looked at each other and I knew I wasn't crazy because he had experienced this also. To the present, so tonight I was out in the garden in the countryside with my partner. There's no artificial light other than the house and my neighbours roughly two kilometres away. My partner and I experienced the whole night become day for a brief moment. My partner was very confused and I had explained this to me before and it absolutely blew my mind. This time it lasted at least three seconds rather than a split second like before. I wish that I could explain what it was like. It really didn't seem natural. Here's some background info. I, a 16 year old male, and my father were hog hunting in southern Tennessee. We've taken trips to hunt for various game every year. This year though, we had a good season for deer and didn't want to let the hunting be over, so we decided to hunt hogs. If you didn't know, hogs are a nuisance species, meaning they can be hunted any time of year. Okay, now that's out the way. He had come with me to my stand and gave me general directions to him if I ended up needing them. I didn't see anything all afternoon, and as the sun began to set, I heard what then sounded like a gunshot, and then squealing. From the direction I understood was my dad's stand. I sat for a moment and decided I'd go look and see if he had gotten something. Seeing as the sun was already setting, I figured it'd be better to help with what little light we had. After about three minutes of walking, I came upon what I thought was his stand. Though it was more like a shack, it looked very unkempt and rickety. I approached it and saw my dad through a gap in one of the walls, and I assumed it was a shooting window. I whispered, asking if he'd gotten anything. He very slowly turned to look at me. If you hunt, you know that your head movements must be slow, so as not to alert any game. But this wasn't that. It was more of a foreign movement. One resembling that of a serial killer in some dumb horror movie. He looked at me with a blank expression for a minute. Well, not blank. It had a slight hint of anger, but I quickly chalked that up to my dad wondering why I'd leave my stand before he called. Seeing that, I decided he was not ready to leave, so I made my way back to my stand without questioning him further. Sure enough, my dad called my phone a few minutes after I got back to my stand, saying he was coming to get me and we'd leave. On the way home, I asked him why he didn't say anything when I came by. He looked at me confused and said something along the lines of, you never came to me. And I laughed briefly and asked, no, seriously, my dad is a jokester, but not a prankster or someone who likes scaring people. But he was dead serious. He genuinely stated that I never came to see him. The next day, after trying for a while to brush it off, 
I asked him to show me his stand. It was not the one I had gone to. And when I went to find where I'd gone, there was a field, but no stand. I've tried to rationalize it time and again, but I still have no idea what really happened. At this point, I want to believe my dad is steadfast in his attempt to spook me, or that I imagined it somehow. But I know what happened, and I believe my dad. Could anyone have a more accurate idea of what this was? I've always jokingly said it was a skinwalker, but to be honest, I kind of wonder what it, if it really was. So please, any thoughts? This happened when I was around 13 years old. I visited my grandparents' house during a vacation. The place was crowded with a lot of my cousins. Came to stay there too. So I was sharing my bed with one of my cousins. So it was late at night and I was pretty much deep asleep. Suddenly I woke up and I felt dehydrated and thirsty. So I got up from my bed and went to the dining room to get some water. I reached the dining room and put on the lights and poured a glass of water to drink. As I was finishing my drink and putting down the glass on the table, all of a sudden I saw a person in front of me. It looked like my mother, but had a very demonic vibe. Just to make it clear, it wasn't my mother's ghost or something like that. My mother's still alive and well. I was shocked to see that, and snap, I was back in bed again. It was dream, a very weird one. I got up and sat on my bed, and I was perspiring even though I was in an air-conditioned room. I was just processing what I had just seen and convincing myself that it was a dream. Suddenly, I felt something pulling me from my back. It felt like a small dust particle being pulled by a vacuum cleaner. Closest thing that I can compare it with is Harry Potter's soul being sucked out by Dementors. I felt this strong pull behind me and I tried to fight it, but I couldn't. Snap! I was now out of my body. I could see me sleeping in my bed as if I was floating behind my bed. I tried fighting back again, and this time I was successful. I woke up and I was still sitting on my bed, just as I was before I felt this abnormal sensation. I still can't probably explain what exactly happened. Today I got some alarming news while talking to my mother and aunt about something I saw when I was a child. Something that at the time they swore was a hallucination of a small, scared girl. Something that stuck with me throughout my adult life. Quick backstory so we can get into it. Until I was about 10, I lived in a small apartment with my mother, aunt, older brother and cousin. I knew back then, even as a small girl, that the apartment we lived in was some sort of gateway to hell. Things that go bump in the night as an understatement, because I can sit here all day and write about the absolute horror show that was my childhood home. I was plagued by these entities, but this story is about this one particular entity, who I call the Laughing Man. I was about eight, and I wasn't feeling well. I was running a slight fever and wanted to sleep with my mother on the pullout in the living room. My living room is set up so that the two couches face each other, one being the pullout. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and sitting up while rubbing my eyes. I looked across at the other couch and as my eyes adjusted, I saw a figure sitting and staring at me. It was the shadow of a tall, dark man. I kept blinking my eyes, trying to rationalize what I was seeing. I didn't know if it was a trick of the light coming in from the window or whatever, and I knew it wasn't any of my family members, as it was way too tall and lanky. As I registered what I was seeing, the fucking thing then proceeds to lift its arm up and point at me, shake and throw its head back as if it was laughing. I didn't hear it, but I knew what it was doing. I couldn't move. I couldn't yell. I was frozen in absolute fear for what seemed like an eternity. When I could finally move again, I threw the covers over my head and tried to wake my mother up, who was laying right next to me. She couldn't wake. I don't remember how the hell I fell back to sleep, but I think I must have passed out from fear. 
My night of horrors wasn't over, because till this day, I don't know if the next event was a dream, or if it was something I experienced in real time. It felt 100% real at the time, but it couldn't be. I remember waking up again and seeing a beautiful table laid out with white cloth, china and silverware. It was completely engulfed in flames, right next to where my mother slept. I tried to shake my mother awake to tell her there was a fire, but she wasn't waking. I cried and screamed for her to wake up. I was choking on smoke and the next thing I remember, it's morning. I told my mother what happened over breakfast and she chalked it up to a fever hallucination. She didn't really address it and ignored the whole thing, but I remember the look on her face. One of absolute fear. Time passed and I grew up. I moved out to live with my dad when I was 10 and I could say that I haven't experienced any ghostly experiences since Gateway to Hell House. Fast forward to today. My mother and I didn't have a good relationship once I left my dad's and we've been trying to mend it recently. We got to chatting about old ghostly experiences because we've all experienced shit in that apartment and I mentioned the laughing man. She then says she remembers that the man who I saw that night in that, died in that apartment. Apparently, back when they moved in, their father, my grandfather, was in desperate search for an apartment because they were basically homeless. When he went to see the apartment, it was completely gutted and being renovated. The landlord said there was a fire, but didn't mention anything about deaths. Once they moved in, the neighbours got to talking about what really happened. Three people died in that fire. The father fell asleep with a lit cigarette on the couch and the house set ablaze. Another resident died in a room and the daughter, who was about 16 or 17 at the time, threw herself out of the 10th story window in order to escape the flames. The house is set up so that the living room is right next to the front door. The fire starting there sealed their fate. The man died right where I was sleeping and the vision of the table I saw on fire all made sense. Also, now that I think about it, I thought he was a shadow. I now know that it was his charred body pointing and laughing at me all those years ago. Growing up, it had always been just my mother and I until I was about 15 years old, when she got married. Often, we'd moved from one apartment to another, so I adapted quickly. Not like I had much choice. My favourite thing to do when moving into any new apartment spot was to get lost. I'd go explore the complex, taking every turn and over every walk. That way, if anything should happen, I knew my surrounding areas. The new apartments we'd moved into were very nice. There was a playground and some basketball courts on the looped road that skirted the complex. Behind the gates that bordered the apartments were woods surrounding every side. With the playground at the very back and the forest extending acres past. When I was a younger child, I was more sensitive to my abilities, if I had any. But they've long since diluted and are probably non-existent now. However, at these apartments I encountered witnessed, experienced, a dark entity that always tried to harm my mother, a UFO, a religious experience via a dream, and a very real ghost kid. Not in that order. This is my encounter with the latter. We moved in around one of the vacation times, either summer vacation or spring break maybe. After the first couple days of getting lost around the front and middle of the residence, I knew my way around fairly well. So I told my mother I was going out to explore the rest of the back end of the apartments where we live close to. As I was walking down the large community lawn toward the road to follow it to the playground, I saw that there were no kids there. I beelined toward the apartments in the back. I was often interested in how others decorated their front steps and wondered what kind of lives these strangers lived. As I turned the corner into the alley between two front to front facing buildings, I noticed a kid sitting in the middle of the alley playing by themselves. Their memory is from so long ago, I can't remember details about this kid, not even their gender. 
I think he looked like your typical average light Hispanic boy from San Antonio. Dark hair, dark eyes, lighter skin. What I do remember is feeling bad because this kid looked so sad to be playing by themselves. As a kid who was bullied a lot, I didn't like it when someone was by themselves and even more so when they looked so sad. So I took it upon myself to approach him and we just started playing. He told me he lived in the apartment right behind him. The front porch was riddled with plants. Small pots hung from the top, a wispy type of lemongrass plant. Grew in some bigger pots near the door and one very colorful elephant pot greeted all at the front right spot of the porch. The thing definitely looked heavy. We played together until the sun lowered. When the lights started to come on, I sadly turned to the kid and told him, I have to go now. I remember the kid getting very sad. He said something along the lines of, can't you stay a little longer? It's getting late, I said, looking towards the sky. I promised my mom I'd be home for dinner. I remember looking down at his toy maybe, or maybe just his hands and fingers. But don't worry, I said, smiling at him, intent on making him feel better. I'll see you tomorrow, I promise. Concerned, he looked up at me and asked, are you sure you'll be able to find me? Of course, I replied. Watch, see. I rushed past him to the corner where I turned and started counting the doors. One, two, three, four. The fourth door is yours. He didn't seem convinced, so I galloped to the opposite side of the building and counted the doors from that side. One, two, three. And the third door this way is yours. See? I put my hands on either side of me in a ta-da stance. I remember him smiling back at me, almost like he didn't believe me. I promise, I swore, I'll see you tomorrow. I waved and left, thinking, besides, how can I miss your colourful porch? I didn't get to go back the next day. My mother needed help unpacking. I remember being worried for the kid and feeling like a liar. She said she only needed help with unpacking the kitchen and the bathroom and that I could see my little friend tomorrow. The next day, I happily strolled over to the only two facing buildings surrounded by other buildings. I turned the alley and started counting. One, two, three, expecting to see an eye full of colors and plants. All that was there was an empty porch and open blinds, revealing a clean, vacuumed, vacant apartment. Confused, I went around the building again and counted the doors again. I went around both of those buildings countless times, even the surrounding buildings. I went front and back, back and forth, and in all kinds of circles, trying to understand where the kid's door went. The buildings were more intricate and woven toward the front of the apartments, but the closer you got to the end, the simpler it became. Not finding his door made absolutely zero sense. Finally, I ended up right back to where it all started. Hands on my hips, just staring into the window, standing where we had played just two days ago. I stepped into the bushes in front of the window to look closer into the apartment. Maybe they had boxes they still needed to pick up so I could say goodbye properly. Nothing. I heard sweeping noises coming from the top of the opposite stairs. Hello? I yelled out to an older man sweeping his porch. Sorry to bother you, sir, but do you know what happened to the little kid that lived here? He gave me the most perplexed face. To my younger self, he looked almost angry, but he couldn't be bothered by a kid's question. No one's lived in that apartment for months, he shouted back down at me. I felt my eyes get a little wider. I'm sorry, what? He approached the railing and shouted again. No one's lived in that apartment for quite a few weeks. Oh, I said, thank you. He turned to finish whatever he was doing. Meanwhile, I turned to look back at the whistle clean apartment. I approached it one more time and looked down to see a giant water ring where the elephant pot had been. It looked fresh enough, like the water had been drying there since that morning, or maybe the previous night. I have a ghost in my house. His name is Bob. I've lived in my apartment for a little over a year now. It's small, two bedrooms, and I live in it alone. 
Over the years, I've had many experiences with the paranormal. My mother raised me pagan, and who believed there was an evil spirit in my childhood home? She called her mother Mary, and would be petrified at night. I've been desensitized by this, and now don't fear really anything paranormal. I hate zombies though. I even was gifted a cursed Ouija board once, though I don't think it's cursed. I found out about Bob first by the knocking. I would often hear knocks at my front door through the night. I'd check the hallway, but no one was there. The outside hallway has an automatic light that's triggered by movement, so it would have turned on, but it wasn't. I didn't mind much. He often knocks on the front door or on my bedroom door, my mirrors and so on, and I'll talk to him. Bob has manifested himself only a few times that I know of. Once in the darkness, when I had my boyfriend over, I walked over to my bed to hop in next to my boyfriend, only to be confronted by Bob's shadowy presence in front of me, blocking the light that came from behind me. He was about 5'7 and was slim build. He vanished in seconds. My boyfriend was so startled he wanted to run or call the police. I'm like, no, that's just Bob. The other time, I thought he might have fallen down or something, because Bob knocks are very normal. But I heard a huge bang right behind me in the kitchen, even feeling the vibrations. My grandmother, who was sitting in the lounge room, asked me if I had fallen over. I responded with, no, I think that was Bob. He's not usually that loud. The only thing scary that has happened was the day of the shooting. It was a normal night for me. I'd gotten home from work, changed and got on my PC for some game time. A few hours later at 8.37, I know because I checked the time, I heard a crash come from my bedroom. I tore off my headphones, looked at the time, listened for intruders and then went to investigate. My picture frame had somehow slipped off the nails that held it to the wall somehow. I didn't think much of it until later around 9.30ish when I received a dozen phone calls from my relatives asking if I was okay. I answered my grandmother's first. She told me there'd been a shooting outside my workplace an hour ago, a man gunned down by police. I told her I was fine and that I was home and safe, as I did with all of my other relatives as their calls flooded in. It was that night when things started to go haywire with Bob. He would tip over bottles that I knew I had set down on stable surfaces, close doors, move things that I know I didn't touch like books and folders I had on my art desk. I felt a sadness in the house, as if something was physically tugging on my emotions. I knew Bob had to be sad. I wondered if it was by the shooting or not. It was a pretty big coincidence if not. I told my mother about him. She said it must be a demon, but I assured her it wasn't. She came over and saw the house for the first time. She calmed down pretty quickly, feeling the emotions of Bob. She thought maybe the death so close affected Bob negatively, causing the sadness. I nodded along. Ever since then, Bob has returned to normal slowly. He locked me and my mother out on the porch once, cheeky devil. But other than that, it's back to the knocks and the presences. Sometimes he likes to leave certain lights on too. I'll turn off a light and hear a few taps. I'll ask if he wanted the light on for a bit. Knock, knock. So I leave it on, but give him a time of it, because he can't pay for the electricity. The year went by smoothly after that. I have a ghost in my house. My ghost's name is Bob. Not all ghosts are bad. It was roughly 10 o'clock on a weekend night and I had finished watching a horror film. Can't remember which one. And I was inspired to make contact with the dead. I did five minutes of research on my laptop, clearly enough to be an expert on the matter, and sat on my bedroom floor in the dark. I placed my full length mirror in front of me and leaned it against my bed and lit a candle. I stared at my reflection what felt like forever and finally muttered some gibberish along the lines of, if there's anyone here, show yourself. And I'm opening the gates to communication. Please come forth. I'd pause and wait and stare at the mirror, focusing my eyes on the surroundings behind me. I waited for something to appear, but naturally nothing did. The longer I sat there, 
the more uncomfortable I became. I gave up after 10 minutes and called it a night. To this day, this is the only explanation I have as to how the haunting began. I had lived in the same house for three years prior and never experienced any paranormal activity. As previously stated, I was 14 years old and going through an angsty time in my life. Depression, self-harm, first heartbreak. I was emotionally negative and part of me feels like whatever I welcomed into the house felt that energy. You see, now I know that when you want to make a connection with the deceased, you have to be specific about who you're contacting or what you're contacting. I left the door to communication open to anything that was listening, good or evil. I cannot recall how much time had passed since I performed that little stunt. Days? Weeks? But my room suddenly became a playground for spiritual energy. My room was located in the basement, a spot I felt was cool and private for a teenager. I put up curtains to separate my room from the laundry area and to and the storage area where my father stored his military items in large olive green containers. I tell you this because it serves a purpose later on in my story. You know the feeling you get when you know you're not alone? The vibe of someone standing close to you, even though you haven't yet looked to see who's there. That's how I began to feel most of the time. So I decided to acknowledge this feeling and called out to whomever or whatever was in my room. I sat perfectly still on the floor and focused. The only sound I could hear was the sound of the television coming through the ceiling as the living room was above my room. If there's someone here, please knock twice, I demanded. I waited, held my breath, and of course, heard no reply. I tried several more times, repeating the same words. The presence of someone else being near was so strong that the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my anxiety skyrocketed. I noticed the room felt unusually colder. Naturally, the basement is fairly cold, so I was used to being slightly chilled. But this drop in temperature crept into my bones. I repeated my chants once more, and after no response, I gave up. As I stood, I heard two distinctive knocks on my cement bedroom wall above my bed. One, pause, Two, as if the knocker took great care to ensure I would hear. Not one, but three, but two knocks, exactly what I had asked for. After that, I felt relieved and excited and accepted that I wasn't alone. It still stuns me to look back and think the knocker didn't scare me. It just confirmed what I already knew, that someone else was in the basement. The odd thing was, it never bothered me. Not at first. I felt like I'd accomplished what I'd set out to do. I contacted a spirit. I felt exhilarated and powerful. Although it never showed itself, I was aware of its presence. That said, it wasn't always presence. But when it came, the air felt cooler and thicker, and the shiver would run up and down my spine. I could easily determine if it was beside me or behind me. Having a ghost for a roommate became my norm, and at first, I didn't mention it to my family. I also noted that I only felt its presence in the basements, never upstairs or in any other area of the house, so I never felt the urge to talk about it. This fact also stuns me because at the time I was excited about it and would normally mention such an experience to my family and best friends. But for months I kept it to myself, and as the months went on, my spirit became increasingly an annoying and more malevolent. One evening I was watching a movie, a favourite pastime, in my room when I felt the spirit's presence behind me. By this time I would speak openly to it as if a real person was standing there and I think because I acknowledged it, it grew stronger somehow. I told the spirit that I was watching a movie and to leave me alone. Seconds went by and all of a sudden I felt it twirl a piece of my hair on the left side of my head. This was the first time something otherworldly had ever physically touched me, and I'll never forget it. It was as if a real person was playing with my hair. I didn't move and held my breath. My strand of hair felt like it would be re-released and then picked up again to be twirled through someone's fingers. It obviously shocked me to feel such a sensation when no one was visibly behind me, 
and I couldn't actually see the strand lift and spin, but I knew it was real. The action felt playful, as if the spirit was seeking my attention. Once again, it didn't scare me, it just surprised me. When it went for the strand a third time, I moved my head and yelled, stop, I'm trying to watch my movie. My voice was laced with annoyance. The presence disappeared and I returned to the film. To be touched by someone who was invisibly behind me and on more than one occasion. To feel an energy that was so strongly present but having no physical evidence to prove it. This became a constant occurrence that drastically escalated as time went on. I would fall asleep in my room fully aware that I was not alone and wake up with the same sensation. Whenever it was not near me, I knew it was my father's military stuff that took up a corner of the basement. For the longest time, I couldn't explain why. I just knew it liked to hang out there. The air would become cool and what I can only describe as thick when it was around. The vibe was strong in that corner of the basement. As the months dragged by, I would speak to it whenever I felt it close to me. I would talk about my day or my negative teenage thoughts. I never received a response, but somehow I knew it was listening to me. I often had my best friend over to hang out and I finally decided to fill her in on my haunting experience. I don't believe we were in my room at the time of the conversation. I told her that I had a ghost. We never told lies to one another and she instantly accepted my explanation without doubt. She then went on to tell me that a lot of military men would return home from war back in the day and commit suicide in their basements, which sadly still happened from time to time. Many men suffered from PTSD and would hang or shoot themselves. When she told me this, my stomach started to churn. I never mentioned that the spirit was located by my father's army stuff. She told me years later that she used to feel it too and that she just knew that it was in the corner of the basement. I also always felt like the spirit was a man. Once again, I cannot explain how I knew that to be true. It just was. When the spirit originally twirled my hair, it appeared to be playful and tormented me to get a reaction. But as the weeks passed, this playful energy became mean. I'd be in the middle of watching a movie and suddenly it felt like someone pulled my hair. The sharp pain would disappear almost as quickly as it came. And sometimes I would question whether it happened at all. It then progressed to jabbing. It felt like someone poked me hard in the shoulder or arm. Never more than once. Just a single jab that made me jump because it was so unexpected. And I never saw anything actually poke me. I'd angrily tell it to stop, but the activity became more insistent. Finally, I chose to ignore it altogether and stopped speaking to it. My reaction was not favoured by the spirit. Occasionally, it would continue to touch me. Items in my room would move from their places or go missing for days at a time. Random noises would sound in the middle of the night. The creepy thickness by my side became more constant. What was once an exciting paranormal experience drastically changed into harassment. I became fearful and urged it to go away, but it never did. It disappeared for a few hours, but would always return. I didn't feel safe when it was around and oddly enough, I became aware that it was jealous. To this day, I'm not sure why the spirit of a man would be envious of a 14 year old girl. On some level, I felt like he was angry that I was alive. Finally, I learned just how enraged it truly was. It was the weekend and I was dead asleep in my bed. I often slept in because I usually stayed up the majority of the night. I remember being in the middle of a dream and the most agonizing pain I'd ever felt ripped me out of the dream and into reality. The excruciating pain caused me to grab my stomach and curl into a ball. The sunlight poured into my room through the basement windows and I was shocked because the spirit had never bothered me during daylight until this moment. I closed my eyes tight and couldn't breathe because the pain in my stomach was unbearable. It felt like someone took their fist and punched me in the gut so hard that it punctured through. This invisible fist seemed to grab a hold of my intestines and twist them back and forth, the way a laundry machine washes clothes. 
I'd imagined it felt the way a victim experienced a stab wound. This twisting and turning of my insides was so savage that I could barely gasp my pleas for it to stop. I managed to muster the little strength I had and bellowed out, stop! The power behind my command instantly caused the pain to vanish. I slowly sat up, suddenly exhausted, and ran up the stairs. I didn't return to my room for the remainder of the day. I became petrified of the entity that lingered in my basement. I no longer spoke to it like I had before, and whenever I felt its icy presence, I refused to acknowledge it. The problem with being tormented by the dead is that you feel completely helpless and lack control. Ironically, I began to feel like it had every right to be there, as I did. Perhaps it had been dormant for many years, and my little ritual called it back to its original home. I felt more like a guest. After all, the house was a military house, what we call a PMQ, and many families had come and gone before us. It was my belief that this spirit had lived in this house long before I did, and whatever heinous act it committed caused it to become trapped here somehow. I wanted to contact the dead and successfully achieve that goal. However, I changed my intentions. Originally, I wanted to communicate which may have been the reason why I was able to attract it in the first place. I, it wanted to communicate too, and now I had gone and changed the rules. I no longer paid attention to it. A few days had gone by after it forced me into a pretzel, and I was babysitting my younger brother. Oftentimes, we would wrestle, which was a good excuse to get out some sibling aggression. I was his older sister, and took on the role of being his older sister, and the older brother we never had. We would playfully throw punches, shove one another, and fight all over the house. That night, our battle began upstairs and gradually moved to the basement. I tackled him and pushed him onto my bed and began choking him, not enough to make him pass out, but using enough strength to exert dominance. I don't remember what caused us to suddenly come to a halt, but we froze on the spot. My hands were still wrapped around his neck when we both turned our heads towards our father's military stuff. Standing in the corner, in the dark, was the silhouette of a man. I couldn't make out any physical features like his face or clothes because it was too dark, but I could see his shape clearly. He stood erect, posture perfectly straight, arms at his sides, and remained completely still. Although I couldn't see his eyes, he appeared to be watching us. The sight of him took my breath away and I became paralysed with fear. All my senses screamed danger, and my heart felt like it was going to explode from my chest. My throat tightened, and I had to swallow to speak. Without taking my eyes off of the man, I whispered to my brother, Do you see that? Maybe I was losing my mind. Unfortunately, after a pause, my brother said, Yes. After he confirmed that he could see the man too, my adrenaline kicked in. I shot upright, and we both leaped off the bed and flew up the stairs. I can still remember climbing up the stairs and feeling like it was going to chase us. I slammed the door to the basement shut, and we remained upstairs until mom and dad came home. A week later, we moved from the house. It just so happened that my parents were separating, and we moved back to my hometown with my mother. Dad was posted to another province and left a short time after we did. I don't remember returning to my room that night. All I can remember is packing up my things the next few days and feeling like I could breathe again, like the weight of the world had been lifted from my shoulders. Years have gone by and I can close my eyes and still see the man standing in the dark beside my father's military stuff. I can remember my hair being twirled and the twisting of my insides. Over the years, I try to convince myself that it never actually happened but my brother can recall it as easily as I can. He was a witness and acts as the evidence that reminds me just how real it was. The man did not follow us to our new home and my haunting ended the moment we left the house for good. I often wondered if any of the families following us experienced anything unusual. Ironically, I currently live 40 minutes away from that house. 
I decided last summer to go for a drive and I did stop at that house. It was empty. I got out of my car, drawn to the house, and I tried all of the doors. Naturally, they were locked. I looked into the windows and the house was empty and looked the same, except for kitchen renovations. A man at the house next door saw me looking in the windows and asked if he could assist me. I noticed that the house that he came out of was empty too. The van in the driveway proved this man to be a construction worker. I explained that I had lived in this house years ago and was interested in going inside to relive my memories. I asked if he had a key to let me in. He said he probably did and fumbled with a handset of keys. I grew excited as he tried all of the keys, but unfortunately he didn't have the set that would unlock the door. He apologised and I succumbed to my disappointment. I thought about returning and breaking in. After all, there was a basement window that I used to sneak out of and I could simply break it during the night and sneak in. Instead, I drove back home and chose to believe that it wasn't meant to be. After all, I didn't want to return to that house in pure darkness. In my heart, I feel like I'll have the opportunity to enter the house again, whenever that may be. For a while, I didn't know why I wanted to stand in that basement. To satisfy my need for closure? Maybe to get a sense of whether it still resides in that house? Curiosity? It finally dawned on me and was my sole reason for driving the 40 minutes to the house. I can't explain it, but as I drove, I knew that nobody would be living in the house. It was a feeling. I had returned to the town over the years and would often stop by to check it out. But someone always lived there. I don't know how I knew that it would be empty upon its return. The reason why I wanted to enter the house was to see if my sinister spirit was still there. And if I was, I would release it. At the time, I vaguely knew how to call forth the dead, but I never realized how important it was to free it from its purgatory. I believe without a doubt that I currently have the knowledge and power to do that. I had wanted to communicate with something supernatural, but I was too young to actually listen to what it wanted. I was too afraid. In a way, I owe it that much. A lot of things happened in my parents' house growing up. From the classic hearing voices of our names being called, to things moving and even some of my friends and family seeing people or other things. Everything was harmless, more or less just creepy, except for the one time which is what this is about. This is just one thing that has happened that most people like to hear, or sometimes don't like to hear, when I tell them in person. So I figured I would share it for others to read. This was either spring of my senior year or high school, or first year of college toward later end of summer 09. Can't remember exactly, but I was 18 at the time. I was up late watching some adults swim laying in bed with my dog, a Pomeranian. Now I got to explain a little layout for you. Opposite the bedroom door was a window. Outside that window was the only street light on my road. We lived in the country. Now across the hall from my bedroom was the bathroom, and its door was also open. Inside the bathroom we had a stand-up shower with a gold frame. With both my bedroom door and bathroom door partially open, you could see the reflected light from the street light against the shower frame. So I turn over onto my back in bed and fall asleep accidentally. I wake up soon enough, dog at my side. I went to turn the TV off and fell back asleep to find out I couldn't move. I panicked for a second, only to realize I was experiencing sleep paralysis. I was so excited. I know who gets excited for that, but it was the first time, so yeah. The feeling of not being able to move, the feeling that something is pushing down on your chest, that lack of control you temporarily have. It was exciting to experience it firsthand after reading about it so much. However, I was able to move my hand and legs. Like from my hips and wrist down, I was able to make fists and kick my legs and feet. It really felt like someone holding me down. The pressure seemed to get more intense on the back and top of my head, and something was telling me to look. Look now. But I couldn't move. With flailing around, I was able to tilt my head back slightly, and I saw in my door 
away the gold frame of the shower and then something block it out. Something was standing in my doorway. I figured I was hallucinating as that was another sign of sleep paralysis from what I've read. Shadowy figures or spotty vision. So I'm still semi-calm until my dog starts growling while staring at my doorway. He was just in my range of vision, but I could see him head down, fangs showing, deep growl. He's not a growler either. He was a yapper, always barking. So I'm laying there in an awkward position, watching this thing, and beginning to panic at the realization my dog is seeing this thing too. So I stopped entertaining the idea of sleep paralysis. Honestly, my thought at this moment was that I really didn't want to get possessed right now. It was a stare off for a few seconds until something fell on the ground by my door and the mass went upwards. Once it was gone, the pressure on me was instantly gone and my dog perked up as though someone threw a ball and he went running into the hall. I could move and jumped out so fast to grab him. I was more concerned for him. He ran straight to the kitchen sniffing around and I was like, screw that, I'm staying up now. I walked back to my room to see what fell. And it was a necklace that was previously hanging off a picture of my grandmother that hung around my door. I did end up staying awake the rest of the night and telling my mother when she woke up that she's had a lot of things happen to her in the home. Needless to say, she was quite unnerved. A lot of other things have happened with me and a few stories with my brothers and a few of my mom's. Maybe I'll tell them. It's safe to say almost every house I lived in has been haunted, plus the places surrounding my family. Some of these have been when I was younger, so some details might have been lost due to the passage of time and just my bad memory in general. Some were told by my sister, we'll call her Kay for this, and some by my mum, and there's some of my own. This story was told to me by Kay, two and a half years older than me, when I was a baby, maybe when I was a year. She went to check on me and she saw two black cats sitting on top of me, so she yelled for my mum. But when she looked back and mum had gotten into the room, both cats were gone and I was fine. This was way before we got our first black cat. This one was told to me by my mum. She used to work as a cleaner and my dad worked later in arcade as a security guard. Mum had gone home pretty late, but before dad got home, Kay and myself were asleep upstairs and sat down. I was maybe four or five at this point and she heard running up and down on the landing upstairs so she got up to check. No one was there. Here's a big detail. Whenever someone walked across that landing, the light fixtures in the living room would shake and that's how mum and dad would know if Kay or I were up and about. Mum said the lights weren't shaking when she looked up. Mum and dad both had a paranormal experience at the same time. Mum told me this, this one as well. I think my grandfather on dad's side had recently passed away when this happened. It was early and dad had just got up and mum was just starting to wake up. To put in perspective of their room, the bed took up basically half of the room. It was a very small room whilst Kay and I had the biggest room. This was a two-story house with two bedrooms. And a little bit of the room was taken up by their wardrobe, and next to the bed was the door. My dad was at the wardrobe facing towards the wall when he was suddenly flung back towards the bed, and it shocked Mum awake. She sat up and saw Dad looking in a shock and asked if he was okay. He didn't respond for a few seconds, then looked at Mum and said, I swear I just heard my dad. Mum asked how and what he had said. He shook his head, then said, he said sorry because he didn't recognise me. Then I seem to remember Mum saying the door opened a crack a few minutes for our dog at the time. Dog's name was Max, a huge German shepherd and a cuddle bug. Pushed the door the rest of the way open with his face and then padded in and plonked himself down at the door and just stared out into the landing. I can't remember this very well, but I remember seeing an apparition when I was eight in my room. That's all I can remember. Don't think I ever saw it again, though I did have some very vivid nightmares of an old man. I can't remember what happened though. Mum told me a third party paranormal experience. 
From what I remember, she said the night worker at her old store was looking at the CCTV after feeling someone tap them on the shoulder when they were doing a store face-up and they saw a trolley had been left out at the end of an aisle suddenly, rotate. So the trolley was facing toward the aisle just before they felt the tap. This is closer to the present day, in my current home, a first floor flat. I've seen three orbs, two inside my room right above my bed and one in the hallway. Each time the orbs immediately went towards the living room right next to my room. Mum has also seen two orbs when she was walking out to the living room or going from her room to the living room, practically right next to it like my room is. Kay has had her clothes pulled by something that wasn't a living person in the bathroom. I saw the aftermath to this and I was with her at the time. Had vivid nightmares, has woken up on the floor in her room with her cover folded over like she was carefully taken out of bed. Had a book gifted from a boyfriend thrown at her by an unseen force and saw an apparition of a man with a Cheshire smile and a bowler hat late at night at her door. She's also seen this man in the afternoon in the reflection of the balcony door that the reflection of the kitchen window, which is directly opposite the living room. For deaths in the houses we've lived in, apparently, the grandparents of one of my former friends died in my room at my old house, where mum had heard the running and dad got pushed by my grandfather's ghost. And the previous owner of the flat had died, but not inside the flat. He died at a nursing home and he didn't wear a bowler hat. He wore what's kind of described as a trucker hat. We don't know the history of any of our houses that well. It was summer in Canada and I, along with two of my friends, planned to spend a few days camping. We actually found a small cabin that was available at this small cabin grounds for cheap. It was a large piece of forested land by a lake with a bunch of cabins scattered around and you could rent them for however long. We booked the place last minute and decided to go there instead of camping. If you've ever been to Northern Canada, then you know how barren the place is with a man-made structure every couple of kilometers with forest all around us. Three hours later when we arrived, it was maybe around 4 p.m. We met with the owner who lived in a distant larger cabin nearby. After talking and paying for our stay, we went off to our cabin. The cabin was small with a stream leading up to a larger lake right beside the cabin and a small fire pit out front. There was dense forest pretty much all around us. Being that far out, we had little to no service. We took advantage of the daylight and took out some kayaks which came with the cabin and explored our surroundings. As it got dark, we set up a small campfire in front of the cabin in the fire pit and just talked. A massive thunderstorm snuck upon us and it soon started to rain. Since it was raining, we didn't bother to put the fire out since it was already basically going out by itself. We went inside and got ready for bed. The beds were all in the same room, so we just talked for the most part since we couldn't fall asleep, with the thunder in the distance and rain pattering on the window of the cabin. My two friends decided to go outside to have a cigarette. Since I didn't smoke, I just tagged along for fun. I was behind them, and as they opened the door, they said, Hey, the fire is still lit. I thought to myself, how could it still be lit? It was raining, and the fire was basically going out by itself. I looked over their shoulders and saw the fire still burning away, as if it was just lit and was burning at full strength. Just after that, they kind of froze and whispered, What's that? If you're yelling and running back into the room and slamming the front door shut. I couldn't get a visual on what they said because I was all the way behind them and it happened way too fast. So I assumed they were joking around. But the expression on their face just showed pure fear. So I took it seriously and we all went into our bedroom and locked the door behind us. They were clearly frightened and completely out of breath. I asked them what they saw and they explained that they saw a wispy white figure that was about 15 feet from the fireplace. The figure apparently moved very quickly and then popped its head out to the side of the tree before hiding again. They described it as almost like smoke, but moved like it was a person. I peeked out the window to see if it was still there, and I didn't see anything except for that fire still burning. 
We basically stayed up all night and never seen my friends that afraid, especially with one of them being in the military. He just held his knife next to his chest while laying in bed and staring at the ceiling, not saying a word the whole night. In the morning, we tried finding an explanation for it and we couldn't come up with anything. We spoke to the owner about it and he told us he'd be on the lookout. I wish I could have seen it for myself, but they swear by what they saw and it was definitely nothing they'd seen before. We still couldn't find an explanation for what happened that night.